Hello everyone and welcome to History with Matt. Today we're taking a wee break from politics and we're delving into the life of Jonas Sabimbi, the Angolan revolutionary who navigated the turbulent waters of post-colonial Africa. Or the play from Black Ops 2, the guy from Black Ops 2. Before we dive in, make sure to subscribe if you enjoy these videos. Jonas Malhero Zavimbi was born the 3rd of August 1934 in Monhego Bay province, a small town on the Buangula Railway. His father's role as a station manager and priester played an important role in his life. Both of his parents were members of the Bueno group of the Uvabunda, a Bantu ethnic group which would serve as Sabimbi's major political base. Not much is known about Sabimbi until at the age of 24. Sabimbi received a scholarship to study in Portugal. Instead of pursuing traditional studies, he found himself in the company of other anti-colonial activists, such as Agostino Nieto, who Sabimbi would later oppose in the Angolan Civil War. The pressure from the Portuguese secret police led to him to Switzerland with the help of Portuguese and French communists. In the early 1960s, Sabimbi's path intersected with Holden Roberto, a key figure in the Angola independence movement. However, he wasn't fully convinced at the time to commit his life to Angola independence. Sabimbi's journey with the Union for Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, began marking the start of his guerrilla war against Portuguese rule. This started with Sabimbi meeting Kenyan Tom Mboya from when he was making a speech in Kampala, who took him to meet Jomo Kenyatta. Tom Boya was still, and is suspected, having been a member of the CIA, or at the very least had significant connections with then President JFK on numerous occasions, setting up the Airlift Africa project, where Kenyan students would be flown to the US for scholarships, including one Barack Obama Sr., President Obama's father. But the main takeaway from this is that it showed his anti-Soviet tendencies. Now, that I could go on a full whole rabbit hole about that, but uh, I, I won't. Um, we then go on to his time in China. Sabimbi was trained in China in the 1960s. Sabimbi earned, emerged as a guerrilla war maestro, adopting classic Mao strategies in, in warfare. His ability to mobilise the rural peasantry, predominantly Uvabunda, showcased his military prowess. Sabimbi was a global player, with the threat of newly independent oil-rich Angola falling under the left-wing Soviet-aligned MPLA, and yes, Cuba was heavily involved here, which is quite weird. Sabimbi shifted, denouncing the MPLA and his early, earlier Maoist affiliations, which sparked a civil war. His anti-communist stance attracted attention from anti-communist countries worldwide, like South Africa, who were fighting insurgents in Namibia, who thought it would be great to have an ally in the region. Henry Kissinger in the United States greenlit 24 million in aid to Unitas Sabimbi's party. As one of the leading anti-communist voices globally, Sabimbi's influence reached far beyond Angola's borders. Sabimbi had a massive amount of US backing, to the point that this video would be hours long, detailing all the deals, so I will be take, do my best to condense it. In the mid-80s, conservative figures like Paul Manafort, who would lobby for foreign governments on, the behalf, on their behalf in the United States, he would do this for former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, former dictator of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, former dictator of Zaire, and Mbutu Sesu Saku, and he would later chair Trump's uh, uh, political ca uh, presidential campaign from June to August 2016. He would then eventually be labelled as a foreign agent due to not registering what he was doing with the Justice Department. Jack Abencroft, who through the International Freedom Foundation, which was allegedly financed by South Africa, supported Sabimbi and championed his cause in the US. Sabimbi was strongly supported by conservative think tank Heritage Foundation, which influenced the policies of the Reagan administration. Um, the Democratic International set up by Jack Abencroft, which was then set up in Sabimbi's base in Jaba, southeastern Angola, allowed the CIA to covertly channel weapons to UNITA. This earned Sabimbi meetings with Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Angola became a Cold War battleground, and Sabimbi was at the forefront. The Angola Civil War in and of itself is far too big to fit into this video, with it being 26 years long. I may make a separate video on it at a later point, but at the moment, uh, in short, it was a long, bloody proxy war that was as much as it was about national resources as it was for ideology. 
and Savimbi was at, at front and centre as a result of it. As the Cold War began to cool down, a ceasefire was signed between the MPLA and UNITA, and an election was called in Angola in 1982, with neither side getting over 50% of the vote, resulting in a runoff. Savimbi dispatched UNITA Vice President Jeremias Chitunda and UNITA Senior Advisor Elias Salputa Pena to Luanda, the capital, to negotiate the details of the runoff election. On the 2nd of November 1982 in Luanda, Shatinda and Pena's convoy was attacked by government forces and they were pulled from their car and shot dead. This started an MPLA offensive, killing 10,000 UNITA voters in what is now called the Halloween Massacre. This infuriated Sibimbi, who became more and more hateful towards the MPLA. A second peace accord was signed in 1984 um, and Savimbi declined the position of Vice President that was offered to him and resumed fighting in 1988. There are many claims made in Savimbi during this time about him purging, purging UNITA members and killing close confidants due to them suspecting that they were engaging in secret negotiations with the Angolan government. However, one thing is certain. With the US provide, not providing support, and South Africa dealing with problems domestically, as well as UN sanctions, and its top men defecting to the Angolan government. The writing was on the wall for Savimbi, and he was cornered. However, Savimbi was able to fund due to the UNITA's ability to mine diamonds. In one last act of defence, Savimbi met his fate in, cla- in a clash with government forces in 2002, sustaining 15 gunshot wounds, but still being able to return fire, until eventually succumbing to his wounds and dying. He earned a mystical reputation surrounding his ability to elude capture from the Soviets and the Cubans. His death marked the end of an era, leaving behind a a nation deeply divided and a legacy still debated today. Savimbi is more well known today for his appearance in Call of Duty Black Ops 2. Savimbi is portrayed as being nuts, encouraging his men to slaughter the fleeing MPLA soldiers, that he is routed shouting funny and memorable lines like they are weak, we must finish them, and death to the MPLA while holding uh, a grenade launcher atop an armoured car. This funny and badass portrayal led to a group in 2012 hacking Cartoon Network showing this meme, which I will link in the description. However, this representation caused spark controversy with Sabimbi's children criticising it as it depicted him as savage and brutal. And that was Jonas Sabimbi, a complex man, a charismatic leader and a strategic genius, and a figure embroiled in controversy. The man was a logistic uh, genius on all accounts, being fluent in four English languages, including English, despite the fact he never lived in an English-speaking country. He was known as being a good conversationalist, a good leader, a good listener, and being very well read. On the other hand, the man literally accused his opponents of using witchcraft, and his opponents called him blood-hungry, blood-thirsty, and a warmonger, savage African warlord who used child soldiers. Which opinion you come away with is up to you. Regardless of what you think, his death marked an end of an era, leaving behind a nation deeply divided and a legacy that is still debated today. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe and thank you for watching. I've been History with Matt.